Versace, 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 Versace. It was the high society murder that stunned the world. It's a shocking depiction of the slaying of famed designer Gianni Versace outside his mansion in Miami. I think to be superficial, you yeah. have to be very profound. To be superficial, you have to be profound? Oh, absolutely. Armadi dresses the wife, Versace dresses the mistress, Anna Wintour. Gianni Versace was born Giovanni Maria Versace on December 2nd, 1946. A prodigy of design, he designed his first dress at nine years old. His mother, Francesca Versace, designed as well. The brand was started in 1978 and was originally known as Gianni Versace Donna. By 1982, he began receiving commissions for his designs. He was inspired by the dramatic creations of Christian Dior, Cristobal Balenciaga, and Schiaparelli. He referred to Karl Lagerfeld as his master. Versace says, For me, theater is liberation. Theatricality and daring to rethink what fashion should be is what made him stand out. Outside of Naomi Campbell as a model, his original muse was his younger sister, Donatella Versace. He calls her his perfect woman. Gianni also says that Donatella's strength is that she makes everything she touches modern. You know the story. The 90s. Supermodels, superstars, the Miami high life. But it wasn't always so great behind the scenes or behind the seams. In 1993, Versace was diagnosed with inner ear cancer. He spent two years recovering. In his absence, Donatella oversaw the design team. When Gianni returned, she resented giving up the creative power. They had epic fights and wouldn't speak to each other for months at a time. However, she was also in charge of the accessories, which were just as well a part of the staple iconography of the brand. Leather is thicker than bad blood. Finally, in early 1997, Gianni had enough. He decided to get the family out of the family business and began to meet with Morgan Stanley bankers in New York to take the company public. Then that day, that fateful day, it finally came. The day that made him a legend in fashion in the vein of Maurizio Gucci just two years prior. On July 15th, 1997, Gianni Versace, just 50 years old, was taken down in front of his home in Miami. His attacker, 27-year-old Andrew Kinnanen, took his own life eight days later. He met Gianni once briefly in San Francisco several years prior. The obsession never left. 20 years after his passing, Donatella put on this tribute show in 2017 that I often feature on this channel. And look how well the designs have aged. I don't think there's any other designer who could create like this and decades later have each signature collection bolting down the runway and have each piece be absolutely timeless. He stood out by the will of his own creative boldness. At the end, Naomi and other supermodels of his era closed the show to George Michael's freedom. This was an homage to the 1990s show that featured the supermodels that were in the video lip-syncing down the runway, and that was the birth of the supermodel and the birth of Gianni Versace. Iconography like that does not die with the icon. It lives on forever. When reflecting upon Gianni as an icon and his imagery, it wasn't just his designs. It was the language that they spoke. It was more than a Medusa head and black leather and bright colors and prints. There is a language there, something that intended to be as hedonistic as it appeared. Something unapologetically hedonistic and it attracted a lot of people. It personified the type of life that Andrew Cannon wanted. A lot of people speculate that upon reviewing that case, Versace kind of represented the peak of whatever it is that he wanted, whatever it is that he got kicked out of, whatever he was aging out of, Gianni represented the final part of that. Donatella and Santo did not want this random person, who he was, just a random person in comparison to Gianni, to be forever intertwined with him. But that is what this country and what Hollywood does to its criminals. It gives them a similar level of fame of the people that they take out. Look at John Lennon. His murderer is almost as well known as anything great that Lennon did in his own life, because he was the end of Lennon's life. We pair the criminal with the icon until their stories become one. The loss threw the family business into a tailspin. Donatella was immediately named creative director, and Santo named CEO. Donatella was heavily using coke and making irrational decisions. 
Within 10 years, the company's sales went from nearly a billion dollars to around 400,000, and it was quickly losing money. The fate of the family business was now up in the air. You can't run away from losing a loved one by running a business into the ground. The saving grace of the brand was its rock star affiliation. Gianni once said, The one who hesitates is lost. Newer faces of shock rock and pop culture zeitgeist emerged in a whole new generation of stars whose affiliation with the brand would help save its name and popularity. But right near the end of the fashion house's prime, there is this incredibly eerie final menswear show that depicted a man being shot by his favorite supermodel muse, Naomi Campbell. She took his passing pretty hard, so it's ironic that this was included in the show and so bizarre considering how he would pass away. It felt as if he knew it would be one of his final displays of work because of how ambitious it was. It was incredibly grand. It felt like a great final goodbye as it pulled out all the stops for a true spectacle of a performance art piece. His final show was a haute couture show, and it was a marvel in some of the best work of his career. He may have gone out, but he went out with true style. Manfred Thierry Begler was born on December 21st, 1948 in Strasbourg, France. Thierry Begler has always put out some of the most striking collections and shows of all time. Let's explore. Growing up, Begler studied classical dance and joined the Rhin Opera by 14. That history with ballet will be very important later on in his career when he collaborated with Wayne McGregor in 2019 to create a modern ballet with his iconic designs. Each look had a character that was practically dancing down the runway in character and strut, so this performance makes perfect sense. The theatricality of modern dance is seen throughout his work. Continuing on by his teens, he also trained in formal interior design at Stossberg School of Decorative Arts. In the 1960s, Mugler began designing for London boutiques, Mr. Freedom, and Mother Wouldn't Like It. In 1971, he began designing for Kareem and was already crafting his signature silhouettes featuring broad shoulders and taking inspiration from the 1940s. In 1973, Bouglaire launched his first clothing line, Café de Paris. This attracted the attention of fellow legendary designer Azadine Alaya, who worked with him until the late 70s. The following year, he created his own label. In 1976, fashion editor Melka Trenton asked him to show his collection in Tokyo and two years later, Mugler opens his first boutique in Paris. At the same time, Mugler launched a one-off male collection. With success growing, Mugler was building a name for his catwalk shows and by 1992, he designed his first haute couture collection. His incredible and distinctive designs were recognized by several artists in the industry, including George Michael, who featured Mugler's odd take on glamour in his 1992 music video for Too Funky. In fact, the whole video is one big runway show in the style of the House of Mugler. The 90s were not just the birth of Mugler, as we know him today. They were when Mugler's show stood out from everyone else as a final destination where the Amazon alien goddesses that would grace the runway would bless us mere mortals with their presence. He just had an air about him, something that made you feel like you were right where you needed to be in current time and in the future. Like you were blessed to be on Earth and witness his designs, yet 
taken straight to outer space. He would also use several unconventional characters on his runways like far older models, adult film stars, drag queens, and trans women, which that was newer at the time. He didn't do it for the very modern cookie cutter approach to diversity and all its virtue signaling of identity that we know today. He did it because if he saw you in his vision, he wouldn't rob a star their chance to shine. Much like several other popular designers of the decade, his next ventures in the art form transitioned into one-on-one -on -one artistic collaborations like working with Cirque du Soleil in 2002 to direct Extravaganza, a scene from Zumanity, and in 2009 when he was the artistic advisor to Beyonce and created costumes for her I Am world tour. In 2010, Nicola Formicetti was announced as creative director. He also changed the name of the house to Just Maglaire and dropped the Thierry. His designs and creative direction caught the eye of Lady Gaga, who he styled for a few years and she became his muse in a way. A fan of Archive Maglaire, it was only fitting. She even walked in his fall 2011 show. Currently the creative director of Maglaire is Casey Cadwallader. He's been able to attract newer, younger faces to the brand no differently than Mugler himself. Although the house codes have been very well maintained with each new designer taking the helm of the brand, there is only one Thierry. He couldn't be counted out of the fashion game just yet. He loves an absurd oddity of a person, so naturally he decided that for the 2019 Met Gala he would design a custom dress for Kim Kardashian. I did create a modern silhouette of uh, glamour and definitely a body conscious clothes. Could you say, I did make clothes because I was looking for something that didn't exist. I have to try to create my own world. His PVC clad intergalactic dominatrixes first invaded the runways in the mid 1980s. Reaction was pretty bad actually because, you know, nobody was used to give uh, high-class credits to PVC. I think PVC is a very elegant and uh, it's a classic for me because it's like a, a skin, the shine of it and the sharpness of it. After an almost three-year hiatus from runway shows, Mugler returned to an in-person show in Paris Fashion Week 2023. He passed away on January 23rd, 2022. But before that, he lived and gave life to fashion through his designs. He always found the beauty and the bizarre and the elegance and survival in both fashion and life. When he passed, an outpouring of grief and remembrance of iconography swept through the media. Terry Mugler's imagination will live on forever. The world will never forget the madness of Manfred. Let's explore the roots of one of fashion's most provocative and innovative designers. Jean-Paul Gaultier was born on April 24, 1952 in Paris, France. He didn't exactly fit in with his peers in school, but they recognized his talent for sketches and would ask him to draw. Of course, a part of him feeling like the weird kid was not just his extraordinary talent, but also his identity. He soon realized what we just regularly accept today, that almost all brilliant designers were just like him. In a way, he saw himself in them and their work. This gave him a bit more of a sense of who he could become. He grew up in the suburbs and always had an interest in fashion, and before he knew it, he would join the ranks of the several influential names that preceded him and helped craft his personal and artistic identity. By the time he was 13 years old, he had created a collection of clothing for his mother and grandmother, and by 18, he began an apprenticeship in the fashion house of legendary designer Pierre Cardin. You were self-taught. You didn't go to uh, fashion school. Oh, no, I didn't go. Not at all. You, you, you created by, by learning, by, by, yeah, by yeah, doing. Yeah. The thing is that I was lucky in some way is that I was like, uh, um, comment dit-on, free. Like after I, I worked with Cartin, I came to see him and he was fabulous. And you know one thing that is very funny is that he, he took me, take me, uh, but uh, you are at school? I say, yes. I, uh, so when can you come to work? I say, but I don't know that afternoon, that afternoon, that afternoon. Okay, let's do. And I work with him like that, you know, and I started like that. After a year-long apprenticeship with Cardin, he apprenticed for a few more designers and eventually debuted his first collection in 1976. By 1982, he had a shop. 
By 1984, he had a men's collection. By 1986, a boutique in Paris. Both he and Madonna had been trailblazing their respective industries, whereas Gautier was a designer with a musical personality, Madonna was a musician who was incredibly stylish. Their two worlds were about to collide in a way that would change fashion, music, and pop culture forever. I used to think that fashion was a joke when people would show up and get asked, who are you wearing? Oh, I'm wearing custom whatever. And I honestly thought it was corny. Then I learned about the significance of the cone bra, Madonna, and the living, breathing Jean-Paul Gaultier fashion show meets theater and performance art that was Blonde Ambition. Honestly, it changed my perspective around what it takes to craft an iconic image. They gave the clothes new meaning, a deconstructed and reimagined idea of the bra, the corset, the pop star, and the fashion designer's presence in the media. This collaboration mutually heightened their respective star power. The shape is actually from the 1940s, and Gautier had been doing it for years before Madonna was even a thing. He helped modernize that and several other trends. Just like his equally groundbreaking muse, he was a household name by the end of the 80s. By the beginning of the 90s, he was a peerless presence in the fashion industry, just as she was in music. The two would make headlines again in a 1992 fashion show where they both did what only they could do best. Shock people. Only he could design that, and only she was bold enough to wear it with nothing underneath. A little bit about the role of kind of celebrities in, in your world. And for me, Madonna is the most sort of obvious and, 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 the, and, the, and the strongest within your kind of history. She's a macho and in reality. She's a macho woman, mm -hmm. the most macho of all the men. Yeah. <laughs> One of my assistants told me, oh, I have a phone call of Madonna. She wants uh, you to call her back. Mm -hmm. I say, yeah, okay, because I think it was a joke. You know, they were doing like, because they know I loved her, etc. <laughs> and after I called and it was, uh, hi, it's Madonna. Yeah, okay, so fabulous. And she asked me to do uh, the Blonde Ambition tour. I felt like I belonged to her or she belongs to me in yeah. some way. Gautier didn't just have a love of fashion, but a love of life. He even had a lover to share it with. He and his partner, Francis Manouge, had an interesting relationship and a heartbreaking ending. Firstly, Manouge was there from the beginning, helping his art tour of a paramour organize his earliest shows. And lastly, these two were in love in a time of fear and misunderstanding of a certain disease that ravaged a whole community and a whole generation. Francis tested positive for that very disease. Both of his parents and Jean-Paul Gaultier stayed with him until his passing from complications related to his illness. Not much is known about him, and there has not been any mention of a significant other ever since. I met uh, my boyfriend, Francis Monuge. He has good notion, good aesthetic, and he was uh, quite clever, and I loved him. We make it together with no money. One thing that I love, which was not the French way, but which was, uh, which is the London way, it was like make on, you, on your own style, your own creativity, and be free to do what you want to do. We saw Jean Paul at clubs all the time. I mean, whether it was Blitz or gay clubs like Heaven and lots of different places. I think um, the whole world of gay culture was really embraced in a very creative way. Continuing on, Gautier started to venture into more avenues of entertainment. He even had a TV series called Euro Trash, for which this documentary was named after, and the show lasted from about 93 to 97. And as you noticed at the beginning of this video, yes, he did indeed dabble in music. And it wasn't half bad for Of The Moment House. He released his single, How To Do That, in 1988. He seemed to want to do everything and mix everything together in media just as he did with his designs. He was even named as a member of the jury for the main competition for the 2012 Cannes Film Festival. This was the first time a fashion designer was called to sit on a jury at the festival. It makes sense because he even designed some memorable costumes for several films, most notably Luc Besson's The Fifth Element. His most notable shows involved several themes like the mixing of cultures, fabrics, and layers. Pinstripe, fun, exotic prints, and of course, 
the ever-growing cyber bodysuit trend in fashion that has resurged in popularity decades later. He was never a one-trick ponytail and cone bra man. In fact, during his prime in the 90s, he shared a special and unforgettable era with several other designers as the fashion industry as a whole entered its prime. It's a time that has yet to be reduplicated or matched and has since then given us some of the most memorable runway moments and designs in fashion history. After 50 years of designing, he announced his retirement. Hayter Ackerman was hired in his place. At 70 years old, much like the late Vivian Westwood, he carries an energy and youth in his presence that supersedes the physical form. He still carries himself with the same punk sense of rebellion that made him a fashion icon.